be hard to recover from. Man, I just, um, it's going to take me a minute to compose myself. Please excuse me for that. Um, wow. <clears throat> Power. I'm really seeing a lot of things happen in the church <laughs> uh, lately that I'm just floored by. I'm seeing prayers answered. I'm seeing lives changed, relationships healed. I just can't share it all with you, unfortunately, because I'd be breaking confidence. But uh, I'm just, you know, this morning, I'm, I'm really blown away in a really good way. Um, so if you're new here this morning, this is the place you want to be. Um, this is... <laughs> This church is, uh, is doing some really good things. No, <laughs> Jesus is doing some really good things. The Holy Spirit is doing some really great things. God is doing some really great things this morning. So uh, bear with me as I <laughs> compose myself. I was getting a little lost in the worship there. And I realized, wow, you've got to say things to human beings this morning, um, not just Jesus. Uh, so <laughs> let me just get my head together. At least we're honest here. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as one of your pastors. Um, I had a really interesting thing happen to me yesterday. I usually prepare my message during the week. I kind of know what I'm going to say, and then I insert things based on what Holy Spirit delivers to me, um, but usually that's done through prayer. Um, and this week, I, I stumbled across something that I, I just want to take a couple of minutes to, to share with you. I want to explain to those of you who don't know um, how Bible translation works, simply, simply put. Uh, because a lot of people get confused. You know, why are there so many translations? How does this happen? What should I be reading? Why do you use that? Why is that on the screen? You know, so I just want to narrow that down for you a little bit. One popular misconception is that, and you'll hear atheists say this a lot, so I want to give you the tools that you need to kind of dispel that very quickly. We can't trust the Bible because it's been through so many different languages. You know, so it's gone through this language and then that language and then that language, and that doesn't even exist anymore. That's not true. Um, our, our Protestant Bibles, uh, the Old Testament has been translated faithfully from the Hebrew and maybe a little Aramaic and Daniel, uh, but straight to English. That's it, no problem. Uh, the New Testament, Greek. <laughs> straight to English. There's no problems with it. Uh, so the reason we have so many translations is not a translation problem. That's not the issue. Uh, it's a literacy and comprehension issue. So basically, if I'm reading in Greek and I am talking to a five-year-old and trying to translate it to them, it's going to be very different than someone who's college educated. Make sense? So we end up with a whole bunch of different translations. Um, and basically, there's like a dynamic equivalence and a formal equivalence. The easy way of saying that is more word for word, more thought for thought. And so you end up with something like an NASB. That's more of a word for word. Uh, ESV, you know, and then on the other side, maybe like an NIV, NLT, the message, which is more like a, a paraphrase. But they're all good, right? Because it's better to read a paraphrase than it is to not understand it at all, right? So these all help us. Um, as we, we try to understand the Bible. Um, so what I found was, well, I'll share that with you in a minute. So we use uh, the Holman Christian Standard. I really, really like that version. It's being replaced by the CSV, which I don't like as much, unfortunately. So buy them up at christianbook.com. Uh, they're on clearance. But we use that here. And that's what they call an optimal equivalence. They kind of, I think, made that word up. But I have to agree. It reads really well. Uh, and it's pretty faithful to the original Greek language. So I really like that translation. That's what I use. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to take you guys through some uncharted territory. And I was really worried because it's a little different. Whenever I find some different things, I'm like, man, you know, did I just come up with this? So I start checking all my commentaries. And there's a lot of digging, digging, digging. And uh, my wife will tell you whenever I'm writing sermons or books or anything like that, I'm surrounded by piles and piles of books. And I realized that I'm a bookaholic. <laughs> I have a problem. <laughs> and she helped me realize that because she said, yeah, man, that shelf you, you, you installed is all full. Maybe you should install another one. I said, oh, that's a good idea. I need a new shelf. And then I realized, I'm like, was that a joke? You know? <laughs> so I got a gift card for my birthday. And I said, well, you know, I'm wearing like the same five shirts like every week. So maybe I'll get another shirt. <laughs> 
And then like by the next day, I gave it to Heather, and I'm like, I was like 10 bucks on there. He's like, what'd you do? I said, I bought a book, you know? So at christianbook.com, they're like drug dealers, you know what I mean? I get an email from them every day. I'm like, no! And they're like, and they actually say, we picked these for you, or, you know, we picked these with you in mind, you know? And it's like all the Holman Christian Standard Bibles. I'm like, no, I don't need another one. Uh, and it's really funny. They really are like drug dealers because they're like free shipping, you know, like we'll let you try a little for free. <clears throat> it's, it's really, really bad. I'm uh, just spilling my guts right now. That's what happens when I don't stay on notes. Um, but I discovered this really cool thing because it was going to be problematic. In, in the middle of the message, I had planned to say, okay, well, if you're confused because we don't have an hour today or two hours, if you're confused, just, just email me and I'll give you the notes. And then I thought through that and I thought, man, you know, I'm going to have to go through like all these scholarly commentaries and mark the pages, find the references, and type it out. But then I found something. Actually, I've seen it before, but I didn't realize how cool this was, and I want to share this with you. And it got even cooler as I explored it because you can actually see it. It's been in the app the whole time. So it's amazing like how many layers deep of technology some of these things go. So if you have your smartphones with you. I'm going to join you to do this with me real quick. I'm going to do it on my phone. If you haven't downloaded the C3 app, go to wherever you get your apps, the Play Store. I don't know what it's called on an iPhone. Um, does anyone know what, what is it called on an iPhone? Apple Store. Apple Store? Okay, so go to the Apple Store. I'm getting old. Uh, <clears throat> and, and just search C3 Naples, and then the app will come on. There's so much that you can do with it. And so you go to the C3 Naples app. You wait for it to open up. And once you get there, you can go on the Bible. So the Bible, the bottom left corner, you go on Bible. This is going to be really cool. And then they'll give you a couple of options, like uh, right below the tab, you can go to what scripture you want to go to, and then it'll give you a Bible translation choice. Uh, hit that down arrow and go to NET. NET. Now, I've known about NET, um, the translation. It's, it's a fairly new translation, and I think the idea was that they were just going to do like a, um, it would be like an online only translation. And that's it. And the idea is that it would be kind of like this organism, you know, so that as new things come about, it just kind of gets added in there and they make the adjustments and changes that they need to make, which is really cool. And here's where I just want to pause. If you're new, don't be scared about that. Too many Christians are too afraid of change. It's not a major change. Like no one's going to come out and say, Jesus didn't exist. Ah, you know, there was no resurrection. <laughs> They're finding little things that actually always, 100% of the time, like they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, it just did nothing but validate what we already know. So it's awesome. And we're dealing with the only faith that shouldn't be afraid of that. We're living in the truth. And when you're living in the truth, right, it's like any other thing when you're living in the truth. You don't have to be worried about it. So let the archaeologists dig. <laughs> Go dig, 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 dig. Because the more they find, the more it validates what we already know. And so that's what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about all of a sudden we're going to rewrite what Paul said or something like that. Or what you, I'm saying that there are little things, and we'll get into it today, that we kind of pick up on and it validates it or maybe changes little secondary things. But on this translation on our app, it, it is so cool. I'm going to nerd out. If, if you haven't noticed already, if you click on a word, it brings up the Greek word and the definition for the word. It's so cool. And then those little blue numbers, they'll give you commentary. You, the commentary will just pop right up. So for me, this is like piles of books just right in my hand. <laughs> so if you want to, you can queue up um, Leviticus 16. We're going to end up in Leviticus 16. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, third book. <clears throat> Gel, just remember it that way. Leviticus 16, I believe verse 8 is going to be the tricky verse. And that, that's, I'm going to get you guys there. So you can pre-queue that up, and it'll validate what I'm saying. I'm not sure if the full commentary came up on that particular verse, but it, it, my point will be made. If not, another app I suggest is YouVersion. If you don't have the YouVersion app on your phone, it'll just be like this brown Bible with a cross. It'll probably say Bible or Holy Bible. YouVersion, it's a great app. I mean, you can dig into so many translations there. So I suggest that. I, I like a paper Bible. Um, I think... It's really good for uh, getting around it visually, seeing what's going on, flippage, as Pastor Wayne says. Uh, I like taking notes in my Bible, but look, if you're not going to get one or you're not going to get into that, at least do the phone thing. You know, it's better than nothing. Um, so check that out, track along. <clears throat> so there are a lot of conspiracy theories going around today, aren't there? <laughs> All you have to do is turn on the news and you get constant conspiracy theories, but that's nothing new. And we're going to talk about 
a conspiracy this morning, uh, a scandal of grace, really. We're in a series on the Gospel of Mark, and we find ourselves at the 15th chapter. So if you're just coming in new to it, I'll give you a little bit of background, or if you just have a really bad memory, I can uh, help resolve that for you. Well, not really. Uh, but Jesus, he has been on trial by his own people, and they have deemed that he's worthy of death. So now they're going to take him off and bring him to the Roman governor. I'm not going to get too far into the history there, but they have a Roman governor. <clears throat> and they kind of let them do their own things, like religiously. They have client kings like King Herod. He doesn't have a whole lot of power. So uh, they have these governors that kind of take care of the areas. So we have Pontius Pilate. So they're going to take Jesus to him to do their dirty work. They want him dead. Uh, so let's start in the text. Mark 15, starting at verse 1. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests had a meeting with the elders, scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin. After tying Jesus up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You have said it. And the chief priests began to accuse him of many things. Then Pilate questioned him again, Are you not answering anything? Look how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still did not answer anything. So Pilate was amazed. At the festival, it was Pilate's custom to release for the people a prisoner they requested. It's the Passover festival. There was one named Barabbas who was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as was his custom. So Pilate answered them, do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew it was because of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he would release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate asked them again, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Again they shouted, Crucify him! Then Pilate said to them, Why? Was he done wrong? But they shouted, Crucify him! All the more. Then willing to gratify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. Now I say it's really cool that we have four different gospel accounts. They give us different perspectives, different angles on the story. So we're going to hop over to John's Gospel account, which gives us more on this conversation uh, between Pilate and Jesus. John 18, 37. You are a king then? Pilate asked. You say that I am a king? Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? said Pilate. Do you see the irony in that exchange? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Pilate's probably being sarcastic here. That's what I think. Uh, you know, there are a lot of opinions on it, but I think he's being sarcastic. It's the way I read it. Uh, he's in an impossible situation, totally impossible situation. I've read commentaries that have actually said that Pilate uh, could have gotten in trouble, actually, for lettering, letting a, a murderer off the hook, like Barabbas, or, or being responsible for that. So he's in a really bad situation. So I kind of see it as like, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, have we all been in that spot where you just want to give up? The situation's impossible. And you're like, I don't care anymore. You know, like, even if it's important, you're like, I don't care, whatever, you know. And I, I just, I kind of see him like this. And it's funny, uh, I think this, this gives more evidence to my position. He didn't wait for an answer. <laughs> he didn't wait. He did not wait for an answer. But we know what Jesus said about truth. John 14, 6. Jesus told Thomas, I inserted that there, context, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is indeed a most important truth. So there's some irony in Jesus telling him <laughs> about the truth, not in that situation. Whatever. So now we get to this choice between Jesus and Barabbas. I want to give you a background on some of the typical teachings. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you've probably heard these teachings. Some will point out uh, the name of Barabbas, Bar Abbas, son, father. Okay, like Bar Timaeus in Mark chapter 10, son of Timaeus. Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah, Bar Abba. Uh, so some will point out it's kind of like a choice between the son of a father and the son of the father. Fair enough. Um, I am Barabbas. A lot of people will do that teaching. They'll say, I am Barabbas. So I represent Barabbas. I'm somebody who gets off the hook, <clears throat> someone who uh, gets away with it while Jesus pays the price that I deserve. Fair enough. 
But I mulled it over, and as I really just started praying about it, you know, where am I going to go, you know, 15, okay, something bothered me. Yep, he gets off the hook. He doesn't get crucified. But we don't know if he accepted Jesus at all. For all we know, he's an unrepentant murderer who gets off the hook, doesn't accept Jesus. It's only temporary. If he doesn't accept Jesus... Well, he hasn't really escaped anything, has he? I'm not Barabbas. Then I thought through it a little bit more. Those of you who know me, I love uh, early church history. I started thinking about like these stories about what these, these early saints did. It was like a contest. I was talking to Heather about it like yesterday, I think. It was almost like they were trying to have a competition with each other to see who could get killed worse. It's like the opposite of our modern Christianity. It is, totally. And so I thought about that, like this idea that we as Christians are like Barabbas because we get off the hook from facing crucifixion, that would have been totally foreign to most all of the disciples, all the apostles, and many of the disciples. They went to their deaths. So it must come from modern Western prosperity. We have brothers and sisters in other countries dying for the faith. They're still being martyred. So where does this idea come from that I get off the hook somehow and I don't have to go the way of Jesus? What did Jesus say in Mark 8? Pick up your cross. Follow me. He didn't say go follow Barabbas. You know, <laughs> follow me. What does that mean? It means he might have to suffer. He said pick up your cross. He gave some pretty clear instructions. So I'm like, it, it doesn't come from the Bible. This isn't a biblical teaching. I get the, po I get the point. So I'm not trying to put anyone down who's taught it, but it doesn't make sense to me when you look at the whole thing, right? So this <clears throat> is where I'm going to challenge you, challenge your thinking this morning a little bit. If you've been a Christian for a long time, I'm probably already doing that. But if you've got the NET in your phone, <laughs> this will be validated for you later, so I don't have to keep proofing it like I'd originally planned in my notes. But I found that this is one of those, it's just always the way we've taught it type of things. I found that coming to the church. I didn't grow up uh, in the Protestant church my whole life. I grew up Catholic, which basically meant I had no relationship at all. I just did my traditions by rote. I fell away from that. It was real easy to fall away from that. I, I was a Taoist for a while, you know. And I worship myself, you know, like whatever. You know, and then I came to church. But it gives me an interesting perspective because I don't have any preconceived notion. I question everything. For me, everything, it, it, trust me, I'm sorry, Pastor Wayne, I'm so annoying because everything is like, why, 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 you know, there, I don't just say, oh, yeah, okay, nope, nope, and I dig in my Bible, I come back to him a week later, I'm like, well, what about this and this and this and this, he's laughing right now, it's just horrible, I'm, I'm really, really bad, but it's a good thing and it's good for you because I dig, 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 I want to know. And so I challenge things, not the main thing, not the gospel, you know, I'm not talking about any of that. I think you know that. So when you get to a certain level of digging, a certain level of learning, scholars will often point out different ways to see things that challenge us. And it should, it should challenge us. And most people are like, oh, whatever, you know, it's too much. I like to dig, I like to know. And so they have a lot more resources available to them. So of course, they're going to see these things. I always make a joke to people when I try to give this illustration. It's kind of like Sunday school. You know, what, 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 we, what do we teach to Sunday school? Like kids, the, the short version of it. We don't give them the whole, right? So there's two of every kind of animal, you know? And then you read it again, and it's like, hey, my wife Heather did that. She's like, hey, that's not exactly what it says. And so if you don't know that, you might want to read it. So, you know, there are just more and more details. So at each level, that's really what it's all about. At this level, you can only handle so many details. So you teach the kids just that's the basic idea, kids. You know what I mean? Then you go up a level and you give them a little more. And you go up a level and, you, and that's what it does. So the scholars, <laughs> they're working with too much stuff. It's crazy. Um, so, careful. I've been encouraging you guys with that a lot. Be really careful with absolutes. Unless it's the gospel, the centrality of that message, careful what you hang on to. Because sometimes there are different ways to see it. So this is what I want to start with. And this is what every Christian needs to understand. The Old Testament, okay, as tedious as numbers can be, is 
really, really important to understanding the new. I would go as far as to, well, I'm contradicting myself, this is an absolute. <laughs> I don't think you really can fully understand, fully understand the New Testament unless you understand the old. You just can't. Logic, you know, how can you have something new unless you had something old? You need to understand it, though. It's super, super, super important. So a lot of you know I'm on Instagram. I'm trying to reach out to the younger generation on the Instagram, and I want to boast about something for the church, uh, for you guys. We're doing really well on there. I started an Instagram for the page, page for the church a year ago, uh, one for the Mark and Millennials Project, and one for myself. I got on there. Uh, my daughter's dismayed. Uh, <laughs> bad. Uh, but... Check this out. Between the three of them, we have 40,000 followers. Yeah, 40,000 followers. <clears throat> it's really cool. And the majority, besides my socks, the majority of what I post on there, it's all scripture. I'm just posting scripture or things about the Bible. Uh, I do one-minute clips of the messages. And so, you know, this audience right now isn't just 150 to 200 people. This is a much bigger audience than that, and that's something to be really excited about, right? Because we're using the technology for good things, like the Bible, like reaching out to people. Um, but I was challenged by someone. Don't ever read the comments. I hate the comments. You know, like, it's like, oh, gosh, you know. So, but I do, and I make that mistake, like, every time. You know, I'm like, oh, comments, you know. So this one young person uh, says, I'm a New Testament Christian, and I don't need that Old Testament. She said, that's the wrong person. You know, so I, I like waited. Always like wait a day. <laughs> Just wait a day. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't do it. And same thing. Bad email, like wait a day. You know what I mean? What was that idea you had? She's going to be like, what was that? Acc accountability? Like a, you know, I have a designated driver. She had a word for it. De designated texter. Does that like, right? You know, like a designated texter. Like, you know, let me, no, 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 no. <laughs> let me. No, no, let me do that for you. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be good. We'll wait on that. Give me the keys. So anyway, I waited, and I thought, all right, what am I going to say? So I came up with this, and let's just put the chart up. I said, if you're reading the New Testament, you're reading the Old Testament. 33% of it, 33% of the New Testament is old. It's the Old Testament. They're just quoting it or using passages to validate what they're saying. So this chart can be kind of misleading references, right? Because I looked at some of the books. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I was looking at what I know is Peter. I was like, 69? How can 69% of First Peter be quotes of the Old Testament? I'm like, I'm missing something. It's not. It's references. You know what I mean? So like Hebrews is something people are probably more familiar with. Hebrews 11. He goes through the story about all the people of faith or the stories. He's telling the story, the author, of the Old Testament. So you're reading the Old Testament. You're reading about the Old Testament. So it's something really important to remember. We really need to understand the Old Testament to understand the New, especially Revelation. Those of you who have asked me about Revelation are like, oh, I wish I didn't ask him about Revelation because he just told me to go read and memorize the Old Testament. You know? So uh, you can't. You just cannot understand Revelation without understanding the Old Testament and how the whole thing works. You, you, you just can't do it. Uh, that is actually, just let you guys know, where some horrible, horrible mistakes come from all this speculation about what is the number, what's this, what's that. Oh gosh, just read your Old Testament and study a little history, you'll figure it out, you know. Um, so this is really not me scolding you. Um, I want this to be an encouragement, all right? Just start at the beginning, you know, and everything else we do in life, you know, we wouldn't start at the last episode of a TV show, would we? You know, <laughs> don't start at the end, you know what I mean? Like if you want to understand what's going on, start at the beginning and just work your way through. You know, I, you don't have to read like a book a day, you know, read a chapter, read two chapters, whatever you have time for, you know, uh, and work your way through. It, it will enrich the way you read the New Testament. All of a sudden, things will start to make way more sense to you. So the things done in the Old Testament, the point generally, the people get lazy about this, they point to Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. That, that, that's what you have to understand. I'm going to clarify that a little because people make mistakes with that. You have to be careful. The things that they were doing in worship point to Jesus. They're a shadow of the things that are going to happen in the heavenly things. So let me back that up with scripture this morning. Hebrews 10 verse 1. Since the law of the Old Testament, for those of you who are new, has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the actual form of those realities, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. You guys get that? You with me? 
According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. I went to Hebrews 9.22, sorry, Robert. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. So remember verse 22 for later. We're going to come back there. But before we continue, this is what I want you guys to be careful with, and too many people do this. Be careful about trying to make like every single thing in the Old Testament become an exact representation of everything in the new. Like it's got to match perfectly and it can't change and it can't be anything else. Be very careful with this. And I want to illustrate this for you just using Hebrews alone. Um, Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. Hebrews 10.10. By this will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Did you notice something? Jesus is both the high priest and the sacrifice. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you take SOT or SOT light, that's our theology school here, you will learn that Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, the bread of life, the light, the gate, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, the life, right? And the vine, a lot of things. He's represented in a lot of, a lot of things. So just a little tangential thing there so you don't mess that up because that confuses a lot of people. He is both the good shepherd and the lamb. So here's, here's where we're going to get into it. On the subject of being the lamb, I want to take you back to the sacrifice for the atonement. <laughs> Again, I'm so glad I have an understanding wife. I'm like, atonement, like, how do I say that? And like real people speak. You know, it's like, it's a replacement. It's like an exchange for something. Atonement, it's just a fancy word for that, right? So it's a substitute. That's what's going on here. So that, that's what the sacrifice in this case is all about. There are a lot of different reasons you sacrifice, but just for today's purposes, basically the animals were sacrificed then to represent you. <laughs> you know, you put the sin in the animal, kill the animal, now that's got the death you deserved. I think that's the easiest way to understand it. It was a normative, it seems really weird today, normative practice back then in the ancient world and highly specialized and developed by God <laughs> through Moses, Aaron, to the Israelites. So that's what they're doing here and why they're sacrificing these things. Anyone who's attended uh, a Lord's Supper with me, you know, I'm huge on explaining the Passover festival. If you don't understand, again, an Old Testament concept, if you don't understand that, you're not getting what we're doing here in communion. You're just not getting it. So I try to explain it as easy as I can. So Jesus is the last once and for all Passover lamb. He's the last needed sacrifice that bore our sins and died for us. Make sense? So you hear fancy things. We're righteous by his blood. You know, and it's like, I hate when, when like, you know, longtime Christians say that to new Christians. Like, does that hurt? You know, I don't want to be washed in Jesus' blood, you know. So that's what it means. The blood purifies things. Hebrews 9.22. We'll go back there in a minute. So I want to take you back to that part in the Old Testament. And we're going to use the Old Testament today to understand the new. Imagine that. <laughs> First, we need to go back to that Day of Atonement. So let's just hop in there in Leviticus 16. And I've changed this a little bit, admittedly, and I'll explain to you why. So if you have your Bible, in a couple minutes, you'll see what I'm trying to do here. Leviticus 16.6. Aaron, this is Moses' brother, the priest, will present the bull for his sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. His sons had messed up and strange fire and all that, and they're dead. So he's going <laughs> to make up for their sin and his, I guess. Next, he will take the two goats and place them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. After Aaron casts lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and one for Azazel, he is to present the goat chosen by lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot for Azazel is to be presented alive before the Lord to make purification with it by sending it into the wilderness for Azazel. Now, notice a few things. First, I want you to notice this. One is for the Lord. The other one is for Azazel. And there's another thing that I did. Um, not yet. Can you just back up one? <clears throat> um, I put the word scapegoat in brackets. That's because I'm guessing most of your Bibles say scapegoat. If you have a Bible in your hand today, it probably says scapegoat. Um, this is Holman Christian Standard, the version I was saying I used, and that wasn't in there. So I just threw it in there to show you where that is. They caught on to something there. 
They didn't use scapegoat for a very good reason. Uh, but it's funny, I don't think they wanted to go all the way with it because it, it, it's, uh, well, <clears throat> because, <laughs> actually I know why. A lot of Christians, this amazed me, I went to look this up. A lot of Christian, really good commentaries, really good websites that I went to and I looked into this, they would dismiss it as a myth. They wouldn't acknowledge it. It's just, nope, that's the scapegoat. That's what we've always said, and that's it. And it just really, really, really amazed me. But I'm like, what is this Azazel thing? Like, what's that? You know? And so I started dig, 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 digging. And so my first clue came in this. Microsoft Word knew what it was. <laughs> Every time I tried to make that a lowercase a, it redlined it, and it made it an uppercase a. What's that about? Okay. So I looked into it, and it turns out that this is a proper Hebrew name. It's a proper Hebrew name. Now, if you're looking at your NET Bible, and those of you online, you want to get on NET, you notice they caught it. It's capital A. And if the C3 app isn't catching it, I know the U version does. It'll give the commentary. It'll match up with exactly what I'm saying. I had to dig and get into some of my scholarly commentaries. The ones I like need a dictionary next to it to read it. Like, I don't even understand it. And they caught it, and they named what I'm about to tell you as absolute fact. They didn't have any questions about it, whereas some middle ground commentaries, well, it could be this, it could be this. The scholars are like, no, it's this. So this is interesting stuff. So let's just look at the text again. So Leviticus 16.8, we move to the next one, just so that you guys can see it. I want you to see it. After Aaron cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for Azazel, he is to present the goat chosen by Lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot for Azazel, you see what's going on here, is to be presented alive before the Lord to make purification with it by sending it into the wilderness for Azazel. Now before you say, well, wait a minute, maybe that's like the Jewish Bible because it's also, it reads this way in the Jewish Bible or maybe they're doing something wrong. You, you got to know this. The Jewish Tanakh Bible it uses the same, what they call Masoretic Hebrew text that our Protestant Bibles use. So there's nothing, nothing like funny going on here. And that's the way the Jewish Bible renders the text as well. That's what that's from without the underline. So remember something. Jesus is a Jew. <laughs> He's of that religion. We need to see things that way. Too many Christians go backwards the other way and try to make it Christian. It wasn't. <laughs> He's Jewish, so we have to see it through their lens to understand the text not through the Christian lens, and what some Christians said, oh, well, you know, we'll just change it to scapegoat. I don't get that Azazel thing. No, you should have gone and asked somebody. You know what I mean? Like, it makes a whole lot more sense. So this is what I'm discovering. <laughs> There's a lot of New Testament Christians out there. There are also a lot of Christians that are afraid to go outside the Bible to other literature to just get an idea of what's going on here. You know, they just, they just don't want to do it. And you just need to, to understand it. So I'm going to illustrate something for you. <clears throat> the writers of the New Testament had no problem going to other sources outside the Old Testament, their scriptures at the time. So check this out. I'm sure you've heard some of these. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That's Titus 1.12, right? It's in Titus 1 verse 12, but it's a quote from the 6th century poet Epimenides. How about this one? Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15.33. That's a quote from the poet Menander. 2 Timothy 3, verse 8, just as Jonas and John Brace resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth, men who are corrupt in mind, worthless in regard to the faith. Can you find that in your Old Testament? Oh, don't my breath, because you're not going to find them. It comes from extra-biblical Jewish literature. They're the magicians in Exodus 7. Those are their names, according to the Jews. How about this, Jude 1, verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. That isn't in your Old Testament either. It's from the Assumption of Moses, otherwise known as the Testament of Moses, what we would probably label as apocryphal literature. That's a bad word in Protestant church. You can't say that. Um, but you can look at it. They did. It's okay. It's not scripture. 
But clearly, Paul was developing understandings from it, right? You can't say no, he was. So here's what I found, to make the long story short, I want to be considerate of your time, because I'm ranting about the Bible now, and I can do that for hours and hours and hours. Stay in prayer for my wife. This figure appears as a type of demon in Jewish literature predating Christ. They understood what it was. The purpose here is to send the sin outside the camp. That's the purpose. Aaron puts the sin of Israel into this goat and gets it out of the camp. Go. So it's like return to sender. A funny way to think of it would be like, let's say you got, you're on a diet and you get a box of chocolates from someone who's not your spouse. You should probably return that to sender, right? Get the sin out of the camp. Nobody's laughing and that's scaring me. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Gonna have some counseling sessions this week. <laughs> Note <laughs> that the one let go is presented alive and is sent away. It isn't eaten. <laughs> Leviticus 16:10. But the goat chosen by Lot for Azazel is to be presented alive before the Lord to make purification with it by sending it into the wilderness for Azazel. I gotta send something this way soon because these guys are like, are we in the wilderness? Um, Remember Jesus' temptation? Mark chapter 1. Who did he meet in the desert? The wilderness. The biblical wilderness is not like a nice place that Pastor Wayne likes to go camping in. <laughs> it's not like that. It's a dry, horrible place. Let's get the picture of it so we can get See, it's like that. That is the wilderness. This is where Jesus goes, right, when he goes fasting. It's horrible. It's like hell, really, really bad place. The Greek word for it is erimon, means desert, literally. You put that in your Google Translate, it's going to give you back desert. So think of it like that. The goat seemingly gets off the hook, but will ultimately die. In later traditions, they actually push it over a cliff <laughs> to make sure. But its blood isn't shed for anything. It's not. It's not a sacrifice. Remember Hebrews 9.22. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Nowhere does it say the scapegoat sheds any blood. The sacrifice goat does. Leviticus 16.22. The goat will carry on it all their wrongdoings into a desolate land. Ah, more descriptive. And he will release it there. Remember, one goat was for the Lord, one goat for Azazel. In light of this, remember Mark 15, Barabbas and Jesus, can we think of Barabbas better as the scapegoat, as the one for Azazel, and Jesus as the sacrifice that shed blood for our sin? Now remember, <clears throat> there can be more than one representation for something. So some will like to say, well, you know, uh, Jesus is like both the goats because he took on the sin of the world. Can we think of it like that? Yeah, right? Just like Jesus is the good shepherd and the lamb too, you know what I mean? The lamb can't, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? We can see things different ways. That's fine. I'm not saying you can't. But in light of the example of Barabbas and Jesus, the comparison we're using this morning makes a little more sense. And if you're confused, because this got me for a second. I actually had to go back and look it because I was going to go somewhere with the whole like sheep and the goats thing. But if you look at the Passover narrative very carefully, it says that it can be a lamb or a goat. So you could sacrifice just like here for atonement. You could sacrifice a goat. It doesn't have to be a lamb or a goat, just as a side note. So just as <clears throat> the goat was sent back, so was Barabbas. Barabbas, who didn't accept the Son of God, is therefore dead in sin. He was going to die in the wilderness. He escapes temporarily, but will ultimately die. Here's the application. Satan is calling us into the wilderness for an easy escape. Come on back. Come on back in your sin. Let's play in the desert together. We can't make the mistake of thinking that we're off the hook if we're in sin. Sin is always easier than following Jesus. Jesus is a hard guy to follow sometimes. But remember, the escape is always only temporary. 
Jesus' path, as hard as it may be, leads to life. And here's a thought that might be really hard to accept. As I mulled this over, this was very difficult for me to even think about, much less to say to you this morning. But it would be better to be the criminal on the cross next to Jesus than Barabbas. If you don't know, there were two criminals crucified with Jesus. One accepted him. What did Jesus say? Luke 23, 43. I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Think about that. It really would be better to be the criminal on the cross. Yeah, we might have to suffer here in this world. Yeah, we're sinners. God did something wrong. He paid for it. But he ended up with Jesus. It's right there next to Jesus. So I think about this and I think, man, if we're following Jesus, we're nothing like Barabbas. Nothing like Barabbas. And everything like the criminal on the cross. We followed him right there. But we get to be with him in paradise, amen? So remember that. I know you're all going through something. It's one of the hardest things to do here on a Sunday morning is to know so many of your stories and keep my stuff together. I was losing it in worship, trying to come up here and just like, thinking, thinking about all these blessings, thinking about all these things. It's like, oh, man, man, I get it. I know. And those of you who know me really well know I share my stuff too, you know? James 5, was it 16, right? Confess your sins to one another. It's a two-way street, and I know that, and I try to encourage you with my stuff, like, hey, I get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going through it too. I get it, and I know some of you are hurting. You feel like you've got a cross on your back. Eye on the prize. You'll be with him in paradise. Keep your eye on the prize. Don't be fooled by attempting escape. It would be better to pay the price for it in this world than in the next. Don't be fooled by attempting escape. We shouldn't seek that. I think that sometimes the idea of getting off the hook is appealing, which is why we like that I'm Barabbas teaching. But we shouldn't love our sin and the idea of being saved more than we love Jesus. It's critical. It wasn't the truth that set Barabbas free. Remember Pilate's question, let's come full circle. What is truth? Let's look at John 8.31. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free if you keep his commands. And if you are one of his, you will hear his commands and follow. John 18.37. Back to this conversation. You are a king then? Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this and come, have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pair that with John 10, starting at verse 1. I assure you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Don't follow Satan's voice. Don't be led into the wilderness. Don't be like Barabbas who took the easy way out leads to death. Following Jesus may be very, very hard at times, but we must follow him. We should not pursue the easy escape, even if it means picking up a cross on the way there. Know the truth. Be of the truth. Listen to his voice and be set truly free. Amen? Amen.